All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 71, bringing you all the best news of the week in the JavaScript world in a podcast form. I totally screwed that up. <laughs> uh, hey, Tivik, welcome to the stream. Hey, Uncle, welcome, welcome. All right, so we don't really actually have that many things today. For some reason, this week was a bit chill and slow going, I guess. Uh, we do have quite a few very interesting announcements and releases, but uh, let us just get started. So as usual, the first section we got here is getting started, all the articles that you need to get started with a variety of things in JavaScript. And the first one today is how do JavaScript global variables really work? A pretty in-depth dive into the global variables and scoping in JavaScript, which um, not to say, you know, it's it's, Relatively simple thing, but there are some caveats that you have to keep in mind, specifically, especially with the let and const variables. So if you, um, I think this is what actually started the whole article because I've seen this discussion on the Twitter and there was a quiz at first, you know, so we have this script tag that con contains const and var, and then you have another script tag that logs one and two and then windows.1 and windows.2. And the question was, what exactly is going to happen? Which ones are going to be undefined and which one maybe there's going to be an error or something. And uh, the answer is, well, it makes sense, right? So when you think about it, but it's not that obvious if you just started working with JavaScript. So if you are in the beginning of your path or you're not completely understand how global variables works and how the scopes within the global context work, then definitely check this one out. There is some really good information here. Next article we got here is using TypeScript to make invalid states irrepresentable. So this is the pretty neat um, article that shows you how to shape your types in TypeScript in a way that would describe the object where out of two fields, you have a specific set of rules that basically satisfy it. So in this case, the sample is there's an object that has field one and field two object should always uh, have at least one field object may only have field two if there is field one. And um, I think there was another condition. So basically, there's a pretty complex set of rules that the object has to abide, right? And how do you represent that? The question is essentially, how do you represent that as a types in TypeScript? So if you're working with TypeScript, and if you were encountered, I guess, uh, tasks like this, do check it out. It's a pretty good write up that shows you how to do that in a I mean, relatively straightforward fashion, to be honest, it's pretty cool. So this union types is very, very nice. Um, okay, continuing, we got how to build Minesweeper with JavaScript, a pretty lengthy and nice write up on building a Minesweeper with JavaScript. Uh, in this case, just keep in mind that it actually uses jQuery to render the whole board, which you know, is not a major problem. But uh, yeah, it's just just keep in mind that there is jQuery. Um, it's not that hard to rewrite that into actually using the native JavaScript. But uh, yeah, um, other than that, it's a pretty neat article. So if you wanted to build your own Minesweeper in JavaScript, then this article has everything you need to know. Continuing, we got implementing an efficient LRU cache in JavaScript. I think we already had like two or three articles about LRU cache in a previous two or three episodes or something. But uh, none of them were focused specifically on performance and uh, efficiency, right? So this one is not just talking about, okay, we're going to build an LRU cache, which is again, there's like tons of articles and we already covered like two or three of them in the last episodes. This one, in addition, has the performance parts uh, that specifically shows you how to measure performance and how to make your LRU way more performant than everything else out there. Um, so it, it is at the very end, obviously, but it is very interesting deep dive into how the LRU caches work, and how you can actually make yours a lot faster, which is really, really neat. So if you are at this stage when you need to, you know, improve performance of things, let's put it this way, then definitely recommend reading this one. It's also a really good tutorial, uh, just general, um, let me try that again, just generally on the LRU caches and how to the how to build them basically. Okay, continuing, we got testing static types in TypeScript, uh, pretty nice tutorial again, TypeScript related on how to specifically test that the TypeScript inferred the types for your for in this case, return value correctly. 
So if you're working with TypeScript and if you are in need of writing tests like this, then do check it out. Again, you know, I'm not a TypeScript person, so I can't really tell you much about that. But uh, the article itself is pretty good. Next thing we got here is how to use ECMAScript node modules with Node.js. Sorry, we did no ECMAScript modules. They are not node modules with Node.js, right? Uh, this is a pretty nice tutorial on using experimental ECMAScript modules in Node.js 12. Point, um, I don't remember which one did they add it. 12.4, I think. Um, but yeah, so how does MJS works? How do you enable them? How do you properly configure them? How do you go about using them, importing and so on and so forth? How do you require within them? and things like this. So if you already want to start using uh, ES modules in Node.js right now, you can uh, check this out. Uh, again, bear in mind, they are experimental, so it's not recommended to use them for production. Uh, they do mention the STD ESM package, which is super nice and super convenient if you already want to use ES modules in production today. Okay, continuing, we got building a Node.js REST API using Express. A pretty small and simple tutorial on how to build REST API using Express.js. So if you're just getting started with Node and we're thinking about, you know, how do I build a REST API? What is the favorite, like most popular framework? Then this article has all the answers for you. So just check it out. Next article we got here is what is Deno and how is it different from Node.js? A pretty neat write-up of what is Deno essentially and how does it differs from Node.js and why was it made in the first place? So if you're curious about the new project uh, from Randall, who is the creator of Node.js, the original creator, then do check it out. This does a pretty good job of describing uh, what exactly is Deno, how does it work, what are the differences with Node.js, and how you can start using it right now, which is uh, quite nice. So yeah, you know, if you have any interest, do check it out. Next thing we got here is how to recreate the GitHub contribution graph with Node.js in Google Sheets. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty basic tutorial on building your own contribution graph or rather, you know, the calendar with the activity heat map, I guess I would call that, uh, using Google Spreadsheets as the backend, essentially the data storage, and then using Node.js to query that and render that in your application. Nothing super complicated, but it's a very nice write-up. Okay, and uh, next thing, I think this is the last one we have in the getting started section is improve your JavaScript knowledge by reading source. It's a really good write up on how you can become a better developer by reading other people's source, right? And I think this is like one of the crucial um, things that you need to do when you are getting started, because it took me a couple of years to actually figure out that it's very important to read other people's code. Um, especially because you're going to be doing a lot of that once you're working in a team. So this article gives you quite a few pointers on how to read the code, how can it help you, how do you approach that and that kind of stuff. So if you're getting started with the programming and if you haven't gotten to the point when you actually read the other people's code, do check this one out. It has some really good pointers. All right, that is actually it for the getting started section. Uh, we got just four articles here today. So the first one is um, not exactly an article, more of a kind of a, a gathering of articles, a set, like a mini book, I would even call it. So it's called Vasm by Example, and it's a really cool introduction to WebAssembly. Um, for the moment, it is just for the Rust and Assembly script, which is TypeScript-like uh, language that compiles to WebAssembly. But they are also adding in script in, uh, later on. Um, so the yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You got the hello world, you got the exports, WebAssembly linear memory, and importing JS functions into WebAssembly. So basically all you have to know to get started, right? So this is why um, it's called by example. Yeah, it's really good. So if you had any interest in WebAssembly and you wanted to build your own VASM binary using Rust or assembly script, which is I think quite a bit more simpler and familiar to the JavaScript developers, then do check this one out. It does a really good job of introducing WebAssembly to you. Okay, next thing we got here is modern script loading. An article from um, Mr. Developit, who is behind the Preact and a bunch of other tools and working for Google, talking about the module, no module pattern for loading scripts for modern browsers and caveats that it has. Um, so it turns out that Safari is actually doesn't really know how to handle no module properly. 
And uh, turns out that, yeah, it's actually in Safari 10, it does support modules, but it will still load no module code and execute it anyway, because it doesn't understand there's no module tag. And there's like a bunch of options to work around that. So if you're working with uh, modern code splitting and code loading, and you have to account for older Safari versions, which you probably have, I mean, 10.1 is not even that old, do check this out. This does a very good job of explaining what you have to do to make it work in all browsers in a nice way with preloading and you know, stuff like this. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of incredible how Safari lags so much behind the other browsers in terms of basic feature support. It's not even, you know, the complicated features like it does supports the ES modules themselves, but it doesn't support the module, um, no module, tag like why i don't know but uh there you go so if you're working with script loading and you have to deal with this module no module pattern do check this one out it will probably help you quite a bit next thing we got here is weak references and finalizers a pretty nice write-up from the v8 team uh, about the weak references and uh, finalizers specifically so it talks about uh first of all starting by saying okay so typically when you define an object it's strong reference, right? So it's, uh, yeah, strongly held reference is what it's called, meaning that as, as long as there's a reference in memory, this will not get garbage collected, right? Then there was the weak map and weak set introduced, which have kind of a weak, weakly held reference, but they use it by the key. So as long as the key exists, the reference to the value will be strong held. Uh, that that is useful in quite a lot of cases, but sometimes you want to have a specifically weak reference for one thing, which is why exactly weak ref is getting introduced into API, which provides the actual weak references to the things. And in this case, they demonstrate how it works uh, using the image and uh, image caching, because you know if you cache images persistently in memory, the memory will grow and uh, the images will never get garbage collected, and you're going to get a memory leak, right? And in this case, they cache by weak references that the reference get referenced uh, once it's cleaned up, and then you can basically replace it, which is uh, pretty convenient. So if you're, I mean, I, I think the weak reference in general is have a very, very um, narrow use case scenarios. And I personally, I don't think I ever encountered anything like this, but maybe you do. So maybe weak references are gonna be useful for you. So do check it out. Uh, bear in mind, there's a weak reference support um, at the bottom, and right now it's not supported anywhere. So it's a very, very new um, thing, and yeah, haven't been shipped anywhere yet. But nonetheless, it's pretty good to know about it, I think. Okay, next thing we got here is Hermes, an open source JavaScript engine optimized for mobile apps, starting with React Native. This is a new JavaScript engine from Facebook, and uh, they built it specifically for React Native. Uh, and for now, it's only shipped uh, with React Native and Android, and it's an opt-in, so it's not enabled by default. Um, but it's really cool. So there's the GIF on the screen that shows you the difference, right? So by default, you have, like, you run the Babel, then you minify your code, then you install it, and then parsing, compiling, and executing is what happens in the JavaScript engine during the runtime, right? So this is how the current JavaScript engines work. While this is great for the browsers and I mean, on the powerful computers, that's also fine. Uh, for mobile apps, that doesn't really work out quite well, right? So you want to already execute the compiled code. So what they did is they took the parse and compiled parts of the engine and moved it to build time. So you can actually use Hermes to build the JavaScript code into the bytecode and then run, install, and execute the bytecode directly on the mobile device, which comes with incredible improvements. So um, this approach cut in half time to interaction on devices and as well cut in half the application size because the Hermes itself is like a lot smaller than GSC uh, and also decrease the memory utilization by 50 mega, nearly 50 megabytes um, out of 185, which is, you know, quite significant. It's not a half, but still. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it is damn impressive. Obviously, there are limitations and caveats. Uh, so there's like no JIT because basically it doesn't really need that much. Um, the garbage collection works slightly differently than what you typically expect in the... Um, 
current JavaScript engines, let's put it this way. It also supports lazy compilation and uh, actually provides you the hot reload and everything that React Native can do by default, right? Uh, so as I said, the engine itself right now is opt-in and only works on Android. I don't know if it will ever come on uh, to the iOS because Apple has this policy where you cannot buy, cannot inject the things that compile the code into your binaries. I don't remember exactly how it's phrased, but you know. Uh, but yeah, it is it is really damn impressive. Like it's really, really cool. There's a bunch of videos, I think. I don't know if they're linked here. And it's also open source, so you can go ahead and play with it if you want to. It is available on GitHub. Uh, this is really, really interesting. Uh, what do I think about Svelte? Uh, I, I assume you mean Svelte. No, I'm not sure what Stealth is. Um, I guess that, yeah, so I guess you mean Svelte. Svelte is quite nice. I did a live stream about it and it's pretty pleasant. Like I still prefer React way, but Svelte is not a bad framework. Okay, continuing. Uh, we got next section, tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. And um, yeah, we got some interesting things here. So the first article we got here is why is my webpack built slow? This is an introduction to the ways to basically figuring out why the hell is your webpack taking so long to build. Uh, and there's a bunch of approaches along with the pros and cons that they have attached to them, right? So if you are using the webpack to build your code and you have problems with performance, do check this article out. It will probably help you debug that. Okay, next thing we got here is progressive web apps caching strategies. A pretty good write up on caching strategies available uh, to you, or like, I guess, commonly used when building a progressive web app. So if you're working on a progressive web app and are thinking about the way to cache stuff, then do check this one out. It does a pretty good job of writing up. I'm not sure if I would say all of them, but at least, you know, like 90% of the commonly used strategies, which is good enough. Next thing we got here is Oh yeah, this is probably one of my favorite ones. So somebody reported a bug for Webpack um, that crashed on Windows, specifically on Mondays. So steps to reproduce, run Webpack, config, whatever, mode development on Monday. So it only crashed on Mondays. And uh, it is fascinating. Like, just, just think about it. There is a bug that only happens on one day for one specific reason on one specific platform. It is, <laughs> it is a bit crazy. So if you're curious, do check it out. There is some very interesting deep dive into that. I think there's also a pretty good demonstration of why, uh, you know, code coverage and unit tests cannot save you from everything because this is such a very specific set of conditions to be fulfilled. <laughs> it is just crazy, but yeah, it's, um, it's very interesting. So do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is the announcement from uh, ECMAScript, um, ECMA General Assembly. So they are approved ECMAScript 2019 language spec. And we are going to have um, basically a pretty minor feature set actually. So we're going to get flat and flat map. We're going to get from entries, trim start, trim end, description for the symbols, optional catch and uh, stable sorts that is now guaranteed by the spec actually rather than the browsers, which is quite nice. And as, as well, the additional things, I think we already talked about them before. Uh, yes, from entries is definitely super helpful, especially when you do object entries, um, like having a way to, you know, convert it back is always very helpful. All right. Next thing we got here is this really nice tip uh, from Philip uh, Spies uh, about how to make your React apps more resilient. And uh, yeah, the idea is that you hijack create uh, react sort create elements and do if math random uh, less than 0001, which is I guess 0 0.1. No, it's even smaller than 0.1%. This is like 001%, right? You're gonna throw an error instead of actually rendering the elements. And you know, this the, the I, th I think, what was the name of this approach? There's the, the approach to testing when you just randomly throw errors. This is exactly what it is, which is a nice way of doing it in production app, or I guess in testing, like don't do this in production. <laughs> uh, it's a really nice way of testing that, uh, you know, your React app doesn't actually blows up if some of the elements throws an error. So this uh, like 
the boundary error boundaries uh, will help you catch that essentially. Hey, front end Nexus, welcome to the stream. Okay, continuing, we got an intent to implement JSON modules from the Blink team. Uh, if you didn't know, JSON modules are a thing for quite a while and they are part of HTML spec actually, but uh, prior to this, you couldn't actually import them using ESM, right? So this was not something you could do. And now there's an intent to implement, so you will be able to do import data from resource JSON and that will actually work within your ES modules, which is uh, super nice. So. Uh, this seems to be already a work like in, in what we G committee and everything going on rounds and W3C tag. So yeah, seems like this is going to be a thing. And uh, I'm surprised it was not a thing before, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, there we go. All right, I think that is it. Now we are coming to the releases. The first release we got here is Next.js version 9. This is a really big one coming with a ton of features. The first one being, and I think this is like the feature that got a lot of people excited, built in zero config TypeScript support. So you can now write your Next.js apps in TypeScript without any problems. The second feature, which is my favorite, is finally a file system based dynamic routing. You no longer need to uh, have a custom server to actually have custom pages and custom routes with like slugs and everything. You can just do it with a file system which is super convenient. Um, there is now automatic static optimization that's basically, you know, optimizes and um, pre-builds and increases the speed and performance of your website and all that automatically without any configs, which is super nice. Another cool feature is API routes. So you now, in addition to having the Next.js render the React routes, you can actually have the API routes that also leverage hot reloading and unified build pipelines. So it's, you know, it just became more convenient essentially. And there's like production optimizations, improved developer experience and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so it is an amazing release. If you are using Next.js, be sure to update. It seems to bring quite a lot of cool things uh, to the table. So yeah, pretty excited about that. I should probably update my projects to it, including BXJS website, uh, but uh, yeah. Okay, next release we got here is Firefox 68 with quite a bunch of uh, things. Uh, like I guess the biggest highlight here is that they're starting to roll out the web renderer to people on Windows 10 using AMD graphic cards. That was the previous rollout happened to the Nvidia cards for some reason, but uh, yeah. So now the AMD users should get it as well. Considering the AMD graphic cards and the reason CPUs that the AMD showed recently was so freaking amazing. I, yeah, I'm really happy to see that, to be honest. <laughs> uh, hey, Castor, welcome to the stream. Okay, um, next release, I think this is, yeah, no, this is not the last release, but uh, this is the last major release of the week is the standard JS version 13. And there's already been two minor releases that fix a bunch of things. Uh, that basically deprecates the node six, which is end of life. So, you know, you should upgrade anyway. And this, um, so it's compatible with the ESLint six now, and there's a bunch of other changes. So it's, this is now my preferred config for ESLint. Like, I still don't like the standard style name. <laughs> like you cannot just, I mean, I know this is, you know, tongue in cheek name. And it was like a joke thing, but oh boy. Okay. It still rubs me the wrong way, but the, ESLint config itself is amazing and I love it and I use it, okay, with some modifications as usual, but it's actually really good. And uh, yeah, it's just another solid release. And uh, yeah, just make sure to update. So again, if you're using ESLint v6, there's some additional breaking changes here and there. Uh, all temporary things end up becoming permanent. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was just like, uh, let's call it finally standard and then it just stuck around and <laughs> And this is what we have. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not complaining. It's actually quite widely used and maybe it's gonna become a standard in a couple of years. <laughs> but anyway, it's a great release. So make sure to update. Um, yeah, it's, it's again, if you're using node six time to switch, it's, it's end of life. So, you know, don't, don't use it anymore. Okay, continuing the last release we got here today is React Native uh, 060.2 that comes with the Hermes engine that we talked about earlier. Uh, so again, you have to opt in into using Hermes and it only works on Android, right? So this is like two things to keep in mind. But nonetheless, this like the Hermes engine just is 
looks absolutely mind blowing. Like um, they've shown. So there was a talk from the development team behind Hermes that showed off the way they execute a React Native app on an older, I think it was Pixel, uh, Google Pixel. So the first one, which was like, what, what is it? Six years ago, five years ago. So it's a five years or six years old mobile device and they run two React Native apps side by side. One is running with Hermes and the other one is running with a JSC bundle, right? And the Hermes starts up a lot faster. Like it almost, it is almost immediate. It is insane how the performance is, how much better it is essentially, which, you know, I kind of expected because they pre-compiled the JavaScript to the uh, binary code. Uh, now, looking at this, actually remembering, you remember this, there was this um, binary AST proposal from the uh, Cloudflare guys and, and a bunch of other companies. I imagine that if we have that, you could probably ship pre-compiled code as well with the modern engines that support the binary AST. That would be an interesting experiment, but uh, nonetheless, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm straying somewhere, but... Uh, Yes, yeah, so if you're curious, do check it out. This seems to be absolutely amazing. Uh, there are some caveats, as I said before. So there's like no proxy support and no JIT and some other garbage collection differences. But uh, from the talk that they gave, it seems like it should just work for the 90% of the apps essentially out there. Okay, um, this is it for the releases. And we have just a bit of libraries and demos, starting with the form data, which is a super nice module that allows you to create readable streams of, with multi-part form data format, right? So you can actually use that from your Node.js to submit forms and uh, ship files in a streamed fashion to the uh, web servers, right? So if you are doing something like this, do check it out. This seems to be a very nice way of doing it. And uh, yes, you can use it as a stream or you can just use it as, as a simple callback or a, I, I don't know if it supports promises actually. I know that you can uh, pipe it into a stream, but doesn't, yeah, I guess it doesn't support promises. But anyway, it's built to be streamable. So there you go. Next thing we got here is React Unicorns. And I I think for the first time I shared it and then rereading it, I kept reading it as Unicorns. I mean, I think that's a, you know, it should have should have been renamed. But anyway, that's a vector icons, um, thousand plus vector icons under Apache 2 license for React that are tree shakeable and uh, very nice looking. So if you are building something and you needed a ton of icons and you want them to be tree shakeable and SVG, which means they are super tiny, then do check this one out. Like, I mean, you know, the fact that they are SVG means you can do this and they will still look good, which is kind of <laughs> damn impressive. But yeah, this is what SVG, SVG does, right? So uh, yeah, if you were looking for icons, look no further. This is really, really cool and um, just, yeah, I guess check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is Puppetry, a web testing solution for non-developers on top of Puppeteer and Jest. This is an Electron app that essentially allows you to click around to create, to generate the Puppeteer scripts and then execute them in a tester-like fashion, I guess. So it seems very similar to Cypress, for example, but more tailored towards the people who don't know how to program. I'm not sure that's gonna work, but uh, yeah. Master of Puppets. Uh, is that a tool or are you referring to the song? <laughs> is that, that's the thing I never know with the JavaScript is like, is that an actually a tool or um, JS? I mean, I know there's a song. Marionette, Puppets, Jamie, Master of Puppets. Okay, so there is Master of Puppets on PM Package because of course there is. And you were referring to a song. Okay, I'm not gonna dive into that. <laughs> song is awesome, I can agree with that. <laughs> okay, continuing we got Mongoose Mimic, uh, a simple but powerful Node.js library to generate test data for Mongoose using only the schema definition. It's a really neat tool that essentially allows you to take your Mongoose config and generate a bunch of random data depending on how you describe your schema. Obviously you need to have a strict schema for this to, you know, for the, all the fields to actually work, but it seems to be like a nice way of generating test data when you don't want to do this manually or when you cannot have the, uh, I don't know, the customer database dumped or something like this, you know, for the privacy reasons, for example. Seems to work quite nice. So it even generates, uh, tries to generate the values that are correspond to the name 
I imagine it uses something like Faker under the hood. So we'll generate the actual phones, birth dates, genders, emails, and so on and so forth, which is quite handy. So if you are in need of this, do check it out. Seems like a pretty cool library. Next thing we got here is Framer Motion, a new production ready animation and gesture library for React from Framer guys. So if you never heard about Framer, they are the uh, interactive design tool powered by React. I never used it. I like it looks really cool, but you know, I'm not a designer, so this is not something I need. And they open source their motion framework that they use to produce animation. And it looks really slick. Like the animations they do are just really awesome. And you know, you can do quite a lot of really cool things here for scrolling, even path animations. This is probably the most impressive one. So they have their own motion.svg uh, components, I guess, right? Where you can define the path and you can actually animate those paths depending on, you know, what do you want to do? which looks absolutely awesome. So if you're working with animation and you, you are looking for um, another framework or better framework, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. I didn't actually work with animation that much, but yeah, this one looks super impressive and the syntax is also quite nice. So maybe you do check it out. Next thing we got here is React base table from Autodesk guys, a, component, a table component to display large data sets with high performance and flexibility. So essentially what that does is allows you to build extremely large tables with hundreds of thousands of rows and shows them, show them in a very nice API. Under the hood, it uses React Window, which is the windowing library, which works quite well. And uh, yeah, it also supports like draggable rows and everything. So you can actually, you know, do things like this, which is damn impressive. There's like a ton of features as well. So if you need to display a table with thousands of rows, then do check it out. This seems to be like a really nice library. The next thing we got here is Quark.js, lightning fast app creation. So this is uh, what they call it is a general purpose software tool specifically designed to help you create projects written in HTML, CSS and JavaScript with native like des desktop app like capabilities. There was, I totally messed that up, but uh, so the thing is that this is an electron based app that allows you to build electron apps. This is as simple as this. I would even probably go as far as to call it an IDE for electron. The idea is that you have this environment where you can, you know, build things and immediately run it as an electron app to see what happens. And then there's a button that basically packages it for you. So it's as simple as that. So if you're working a lot with Electron, maybe do check it out. Maybe this will simplify quite a few things for you. Uh, maybe not, maybe it's actually gonna <laughs> complicate them. I personally haven't tried it yet, but it does look at, like it has potential basically, you know? Okay, next thing we got here is ABCJS, a JavaScript for rendering ABC music notation that turns this into this and is super tiny. So let me make it bigger. I honestly never written music in this kind of notation, but I know that it's kind of common, but yeah. And you can generate like shits like this. And I imagine also play it looks quite nice. So, you know, if you're working with music a lot and with the music notation, ABC notation, then uh, do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. Next thing we got here is Image Min Merlin, a super easy automated image compression, a package that is basically aimed to give you a one command image compression for all your images in the project that you should run on uh, either pre-commit or pre-build. Seems to be quite nice. I'm not sure how well it fares, but I, yeah, I imagine it should be quite okay, right? So maybe try it out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is Humanized Duration JS, a library that turns seconds into a proper human readable duration. As in, you know, instead of uh, 12,000 seconds, you will actually see one day, three hours, whatever. So it actually humanizes it. It also seems to have localization and everything, which is quite nice. So if you are working a lot with the durations, do check it out. There is. Yeah, that's quite a lot of options actually. So maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is QuickJS, another JavaScript engine that was just publicly released. And it's a small and embeddable, blah, blah. let me try that again. Small and embeddable JavaScript engine that aims to be really fast. Um, so 
yeah, they have the benchmarks here and they compare themselves to other embeddables. So this is specifically aimed at embeddable JavaScript engines. The cool thing is that they actually uh, pass all the bench v8 benchmarks, uh, which is not all the, you know, something not all the JavaScript embeddable JavaScript engines can do. So there are some of them that doesn't support some features. But this one actually does, and it is quite a bit faster than everything else. So this is, you know, if you if you are working with embeddable JavaScript and you needed something that is spec compliant and small and fast, then do check it out. This actually seems to be pretty damn impressive. It is just 190 kilobyte of x86 code for a simple Hello World program, which is, yeah, that's, that's damn impressive. Okay, continuing, we got the Hermes that we already talked about. So this is the new JavaScript engine from Facebook that is built specifically for React Native on Android. Again, you, I believe you can also build it uh, and run it on any other architecture. So it's like written in C, but I think it should compile to other things. I actually want to try and build it and see if I can, you know, compile a program on like Docker or something and deploy it with a Docker to the cloud and see if the performance will actually change. I'm curious about that. But yeah, if you want to play around with the Hermes, do check it out. They, it is open source and I believe it is MIT licensed. So there you go. Okay, next thing we got here is recursive JS repo. This is an educational library submitted by one of the viewers that uh, includes a bunch of recursive uh, algorithm that show how to work around the tail call uh, optimization that is obviously not yet available in all like in nearly all browsers. I think the Firefox was the is the only one who supports it. Um, but yeah, so how do you do that? And there's a bunch of uh, algorithms implemented here, so you can actually see uh, how do you implement that. And uh, oh, was it Safari? Okay, I'm mistaken. So it was Safari was the only one who actually implemented it. Okay. I remember Google also finished the implementation, but then backed out for some reason. I'm not, like, I'm not sure why, but uh, there we go. Anyway, if you want to learn about the recursive algorithms and how to build them, do check this one out. There is a pretty nice source code here for quite a bit of algorithms. Okay, continuing. And the last uh, demo we got here for today is the glitch for VS Code. This is a VS Code plugin that allows you to build and deploy glitch apps right from the VS code, which is super convenient. So if you ever wanted to share your code by, you know, running it through glitch, which is, um, I mean, it's a pretty nice way of doing it. Do check it out. It is a pretty decent integration. Um, I mean, you know, I guess my main complaint with the glitch is that it doesn't integrate the VS code or Monaco as the editor on their web page, which makes it a bit less of a good experience, I guess, than the code sandbox, which does have full VS code integrated, but uh, the glitch itself is a pretty nice platform for sharing code. So yeah, do check it out. Maybe this is what you wanted. Right. This is it for libraries and demos. We got uh, some interesting and silly stuff here. I don't think we have anything silly this time. I mean, we do have one silly thing, but okay. So first thing I want to highlight is this algorithm visualizer, a really neat tool for visualizing a bunch of algorithms. So there's like a ton of them here. Some of them are JavaScript, others are actually Java, which at least, you know, from clicking around, this is what I saw. There was a Java, I think, yeah, this one was Java, yeah. And it actually like compiles and runs it in code and you can click play and it will actually show you the algorithm execution step by step, which is really, really cool. And you can also like pause and go through steps yourself. So if you're learning algorithms and if you're a visual person, then do check this one out. It definitely looks really, really cool. Um, next thing we got here is the article titled write code that is easy to delete, not easy to extend. A pretty interesting discussion into the way that you should think about your code and write your code. And you know, the title kind of sums it up so that your code should be easy to remove from the app, not easy to extend or change. And uh, I think that's a very valid point. So if you are, yeah, there's the steps they have here. If you just read the titles, they are kind of contrary to each other, but the article itself is absolutely interesting. So if you're at the point where you're already starting to think about, you know, the more high level uh, codes, features, architecture and stuff like this, do check it out. There's a lot of very interesting thoughts in here that will hopefully help you uh, think about your code in a better way. Let's put it this way. 
Okay, now the silly thing. Uh, UK ISP group names Mozilla internet villain for supporting DNS over HTTPS. Now, yeah, this is a new feature, right? It was shipped in Firefox and you can enable it in settings and uh, it basically allows you to do DNS requests over HTTPS, which means they're gonna be encrypted and nobody's gonna be able to see what exactly are you resolving. And of course, the ISPs are very angry about that because they can no longer spy on you using that, right? They can no longer collect the data and everything because it's encrypted now. And of course, they're gonna call Mozilla internet villain because yes, because they can no longer spy on people. <laughs> I'm really hoping that um, Chrome or maybe Edge guys will also support DNS over HTTPS soon. Or maybe I just switched to Firefox because it seems like a very neat feature. Like, yeah, so if you are using Firefox, go ahead and enable it. It literally takes one click in your settings. And if it's gonna, you know, annoy governments and ISPs, then I'm all in for that. <laughs> that means it's a good feature. All right, the last thing I wanna highlight here today is the new book from the Basecamp guys, from the Jason Fried and the team behind Basecamp. Uh, it's called Shape Up, and it is a pretty good book on product development. So I'm still reading through it. I'm not completely through it, uh, but uh, you know, for the first, I think I read like four or five chapters. There are some really cool thoughts on product development in here. Like there are some things that seem obvious once you read them, but before actually reading about this, I never even thought about the product development in a way that they describe it. You know, so like once you, again, once you read that, it seems like, oh, right, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. But prior to this, it all seemed like something contrarian, I guess, something that, you know, you just go by the old, like, I mean, I'm saying by the old ways, but that's not really, by the commonly accepted ways, let's call it this way. So like a good example is, the um what was it the wireframes right so this this the point that the wireframes are too concrete so they don't work with wireframes because when you do the wireframing and you create the wireframe and you give it to a designer designer is very restricted by your wireframe and cannot actually think or rarely can think outside of these boundaries which is something that makes perfect sense right but i never thought about this before and i always i also always started my project with wireframing and yes, I always put too much details in them as well. So I probably would stop doing that now. So yeah, again, if you're doing product development, highly recommend that there's some really cool thoughts in here. And yeah, it's, it's free, you can read it here. I think you can also buy the book actually. I'm not, not sure if they published it, uh, but nonetheless, it's a really cool one, highly recommended. All right, um, that is actually it from my side. This was BXGS episode 71. If you guys have any questions or suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, then as always, you can find all the links mentioned on the GitHub or on bxjs.dev. If you missed the podcast, you can watch the VOD on Twitch immediately once I'm done or on YouTube once I re-upload it there. If you have any questions or wanna share your stuff, feel free to do that on Twitter or in our Discord server. If you need help with JavaScript, also feel free to join our Discord server. We are more than happy to chat about it. Um, yeah, that's basically it from my side. Uh, doesn't seem like chat has any questions. So uh, thank you guys very much for watching. Help with Docker. Yeah, sure, help with Docker. I'm working with Docker pretty much daily. So we'll be more than happy to help with Docker. Do join and ask away as well. I mean, basically anything that I've live streamed at any point, which includes uh, Docker, Node.js, Golang, uh, what what else did we do? Um, WebAssembly, uh, wh wh like, you know, just pick a stream that I did and if it includes the topic that you want to ask about, the answer is yes. <laughs> Let's just put it this way. All right, uh, yeah, doesn't seem like there's any more questions. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Yeah, then let's just go and enjoy our weekends. Uh, so have a great rest of the weekend or awesome rest of the week if you're watching a video of this. And I see you next week. Bye.